In future episodes, we'll log into PeopleSoft and use JavaScript to change the user experience. But for now, let's cover some JavaScript basics. First, I have a web browser and its developer tools open. Now, each browser includes a JavaScript console, which is a great place to practice JavaScript. So let's start with a variable declaration. How about var name? Notice we declare variables with the reserved word var, which seems to be short for variable. Now, differences between people code and JavaScript are that JavaScript doesn't have scope modifiers, such as local, component, and global. And with JavaScript, we don't declare a variable type. I didn't specify this as a number or a date or a string. A JavaScript variable is equivalent of a people code any. And just like people code, the variable assumes the type of its content, meaning we could reassign it later. So for example, now it's name, so it's a string, but later we could reassign it to be a number, depending on its contents. So let's name this person Roberta Jordan. Notice that we can declare and assign on the same line, just like people code. And we quote strings, just like people code. Now, a difference between people code and JavaScript is that people code strings always use real double quotes, no single quotes, also known as the apostrophe. JavaScript, on the other hand, allows both. When using quotes in a people code string, we have to use double quotes. That's always kind of tricky. Double quotes when you're quoting quotes inside strings. With JavaScript, we just use a single quote on the outside and then our double quotes on the inside. Now, another really cool feature of JavaScript is we can use escape sequences in our strings. For example, let's say we wanted to put a new line character between Roberta and Jordan. I would use backslash n to represent a new line. Now, getting back to similarities between people code, we terminate lines with a semicolon. Okay, how about another variable? How about var id equals kul, and I'll go ahead and use the apostrophe, the single quote here for this one. And I think that Roberta also needs a birth date. How about var birth date equals, mm, you know what? How old? Let's make Roberta 35. Now, let's see, I could probably do the math from today, count back 35 years. I have an idea. Let's ask JavaScript to do that for us. Let's get a little help from JavaScript. So let's start by assigning this birth date to the current date. So let's create a date object. So with this assignment, we see object creation. Now in people code, we would have used the create keyword, but in JavaScript, we use the new keyword. And just like people code, JavaScript objects have constructors. And the default constructor for a date sets the object's value to today. So birth date now has the value of today. Actually, let's print it. And we can see that's right now, today. So let's go ahead and subtract 35 years from the current date. So let's see, birth date dot set full year, birth date dot get full year minus 35, 35 years ago. And then let's go ahead and print it, birth date. And we can see, in fact, 35 years ago would have been 1986. Now let's talk about scope again. JavaScript doesn't have scope modifiers, but scope exists. JavaScript variables declared with var have function scope, meaning any variable declared inside a function is scoped to the curly braces surrounding the function. In the code we wrote in the console, I don't see any curly braces, or I don't see the word function. So these variables are globally scoped. Now, if we wrapped them in a function, then they would be scoped to that function. So let's do this. Let's create a function. Let's create a function that returns the number of years from today. So how about function years ago? Now we're going to need, that's the name of a function is years ago, and it's going to need a parameter, how many years ago? So let's do this, years, and then we'll put in our curly braces for our function. Now I'm about to hit the enter key, but you know, you may have seen this in the console, each time you hit the enter key, the console interprets the code that you just typed in the console. So if we want to insert multiple lines, I'll press the shift key and then the enter key, and that allows me to have a new line. Now, before we go on to enter another line though, let's talk about some differences between people code and JavaScript. So in people code, we can declare functions also. And when we declare a function in people code, if the function returns a value, we would have a returns clause here at the end. 
but this is JavaScript. And in JavaScript, we don't type our variables and we don't type our functions. So we don't use a returns clause. Likewise, if this were people code and we wanted to ensure that we're only receiving a number, we would use a type here. But this is JavaScript and in JavaScript, we don't type our variables. So we leave that out. Okay, let's go ahead and close our function. And now let's implement our function. So var result, result now is scoped inside of the curly braces. So I can't use the result variable outside of the curly braces, outside this function. Var result equals new date and shift enter and results dot set full year result dot get full year minus go backwards years ago minus years our variable and then let's return result similar to people code as well isn't it using the return statement to return a value well let's hit the enter key and let the javascript interpreter interpret our javascript Okay, let's test it out. Years ago, let's try 35 again. Okay, yep. A few minutes may have passed, but otherwise it's the same. Let's try 25. Now, if 35 gets us 86, then 25 should get us 96, right? That's perfect. Oh, and you know, I'm just curious. I said that result is scoped inside the curly braces. Let's find out. Let's try it out. Let's print the value of result. Nope, it's not defined, is it? Because it's scoped inside the function. Now, here's an important difference between people code and JavaScript. With JavaScript, we can have function references, or put another way, we can have variables that point to functions, or more importantly, we can have variables that point to executable code blocks, which might be functions or methods. Let me show you. I'm going to create a new variable here. Let's call this. How about var new function name? Very creative there equals years ago. And now I can invoke new function name as if it were years ago. 35. Great. Now you might say that years ago declared up here is a variable pointer itself. So we can see here we have function and we see years ago. And as we can see, we can have variables pointing to functions or executable code blocks. And then once we've done that, we can redefine years ago. And this is a very powerful trick. It's a trick we use to override the PeopleSoft deliver JavaScript functions. Okay, now with all that said, some people think that everything should be declared as a variable. So instead of saying function years ago, we should instead have said var years ago equals function. And notice there's no name here between functions and parentheses. So we now have an anonymous function, but when the people, when the JavaScript interpreter interprets this JavaScript, the return value of this interpretation will be a function pointer that is then stored in the variable years ago. Now, I want to end this episode by showing some browser-specific JavaScript objects and methods you'll find useful. The first is the document object. So let's go ahead and log into PeopleSoft. Now, we'll use the document object to identify or locate HTML that we might want to transform. Now, my two favorite selection methods are get element by ID and query selector. So I want to show you how these methods work. So let's select an element by ID. Uh, looking at the screen here, I want to find an HTML element. How about the eight here? Let's see if we can find it. So let's inspect. And in the HTML, we see that it does have, in fact, it has an ID. So that's a super easy selector. So let's try that. And let's see if I want to go to the console. So I would then say document dot. But you know what? We're working with both HTML and JavaScript at the same time. And you notice they're on two separate tabs. Well, we can bring them together, at least in Chrome Developer Tools, by opening the console drawer. So we can see JavaScript and HTML elements at the same time. So how about document dot, oops, element by ID. We'll put our ID selector in there. 
Let's see. And we get back an HTML element. That's perfect. And you can see as I hover over the HTML, the selected HTML, it does in fact highlight the eight. So that's perfect. Okay. What about the value on the inside? Let's get that value dot enter text. Oh, look at that. So we get the number back. Wait, is it a number? Actually, you'll notice it's quoted. It's a string. It's text. Every value in HTML is text. Okay, so it looks like a number. So let's say we want to use it in a calculation. Let's add two to that number. Okay, so let's see, enter text plus two. I was kind of expecting 10, <laughs> but you notice it gave us back 82. Well, what is that? It's eight and two concatenated together. See, in people code, the concatenation operator is the bar, and the ca mathematical calculation addition operator is the plus. Here we can see that in JavaScript, the plus serves double duty. It is both the addition operator as well as the concatenation operator. And so what the JavaScript interpreter did here is it said, okay, let's see. So you gave me a string. So we're starting from a string, and we're going to say, okay, we're going to concatenate a two to that string we get 82. Now, if we wanted to actually do the math, we would have to first cast that eight from a string into a number. So let's try that. How about parse int? We'll explicitly convert it to a number first, and then we'll add two. Perfect. Now we get 10. Now, that's a long statement, isn't it? Notice how many times we evaluated the same expression. So it might be simpler to read that into a variable. So that might look like this. How about var count equals, and then we'll just return that inner text. So and then we'd go through the conversion and the math process, etc. Oh, you know what? I just realized I did something we discourage. I just declared a variable and I declared it at the global level. We discourage polluting. We call that namespace pollution. We discourage polluting the global namespace. Now, if you prefix all of your variables with your site-specific prefix, I don't expect any sort of variable collisions, but generally, we want to avoid declaring variables within the global namespace. I mean, here, take a look. So as I type the window dot, this is the global namespace. Look at all of these items already declared into the global namespace. Now, some of these are browser-specific. Some of them are people tools, like do navbar, do logout, do home, do help. Those are all people tool specific JavaScript functions. Well, notice the length of this scroll bar. And so when we're declaring our own variables, there's the potential for a collision. We might redefine something that's already defined. So how do you avoid declaring variables in the global namespace? You wrap them in functions. And if you want to fully avoid namespace clutter, you place your code in an anonymous self-executing function. Here, let me show you what that looks like. So we start with the word function, and we're not going to give it a name. It's anonymous. And so then we put all of our code inside this function. So var count, and we'll put that inside of our function. And then if we want it to self-execute, we wrap that in parentheses and we put our invoking parentheses in there as well. So it becomes a self-executing anonymous function. Okay, now another method I wanted to show you is the query selector method. The query selector method allows us to select elements using a CSS selector, sometimes an ID selector. While an ID selector is by far the most specific and the most effective and efficient, sometimes it's not practical. Let's find something here on the page. How about, well, let's, let's try the logo. So let's inspect the logo. And I can see in the HTML, NUI, new, new user interface, HDR header, new user interface header logo. Okay, so I see a style class there that I think that's probably pretty unique. Can't imagine any other elements have a new user interface header logo style class. Okay, but ID would be better. Anytime you can use an ID selector, that's the best selector to use. I look here and I see win zero div dollar I don't know. I see field 27. That sounds generated. I don't think I want to trust that. 
I don't think I want to write code depending on that exact field referencing Nui header logo. In fact, here, watch this. In a new window, I'm going to inspect the same element. And we see this time it says win five. So over here, it's win zero. But in a new window, it's win five. So how would you write a selector for that? Actually, there is a trick. We can cover that in another episode. It involves partial matching selectors, which are very slow. So we want to avoid that if possible. Anyway, win five, that five comes from the URL where we see the number five in the URL versus zero, no number in the URL. Okay, so in this case, we want to use a class selector instead. So let's do this. How about document.querySelector? And then we write some a CSS selector as if we were defining a style sheet right here. Dot, and I just want to make sure I avoid typos, so let's copy paste. Dot would be what you'd put in front of a class selector, dot class name. Oh, and I can see the light text there of the element that the, the console says, hey, that's the element I'm going to select. That's perfect, isn't it? Well, let's hit the enter key, and sure enough, it returns back that element. Okay, let's see. What do we want to do with it, though? Let's add a style class. Let's just add one of the Oracle delivered style classes, one of those that's documented in the, the Fluid UI CSS guide. So how about dot class list dot add, and oh, I don't know, what about PSC hidden? And hit the enter key. Now watch the logo. Oh, it's gone, isn't it? That's right. Now I want you to note I'm intermixing the double quotes with the single quotes. That's because I want to show you there's no difference between the two from a JavaScript perspective. Now, many people would say you should stick with one. Be consistent. And what you'll find is that most libraries out there use single quotes. That way they can put double quotes in their text anywhere they want to. Okay, let's, let's, let's bring the logo back. We'll just remove that style class. I mean, that's not really practical, is it? Are you going to write JavaScript to hide the logo? Probably not. How about some JavaScript to move the logo? How about instead of hiding it, let's move it to the right 10 characters wide. So how about add style class PSC padding dash left 10 EM. So watch the logo. You're going to see it jump to the right. Again, maybe not so practical. Now, in a future episode, we'll take this a bit further. Now, at JSN Pros, we teach people tools concepts every week. So be sure to check out our website to see what we're offering next. Or here's an idea. Subscribe to our LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter feeds to receive updates every time we post a course. Or do you have a team that wants to learn more? Give us a call. Let's get something scheduled. Now, before we go, I have a question for you. Do you have a topic you'd like us to cover in a future soundbite? Let us know by sharing your idea at soundbites.jsmpros.com. And now, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe for more content. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode.